The following is a keynote speaker presentation from the ACM 97 conference, the next 50 years of computing. ACM 97 brought together over 2,000 leaders and luminaries from all aspects of the computing world to discuss and predict what the next 50 years of computing has in store. ACM 97 underwriters were Computer World, Hewlett Packard, Intel, Microsoft, and Sun Microsystems. Sponsors were Cadmus Journal Services, IBM, Netscape, Popular Science, Sheridan Printing Company Incorporated, Silicon Graphics Incorporated, SoftBank, and Unisys. The event also included a major exposition with a paleotechnic look back to the future from the year 2047, and a specially commissioned book, Beyond Calculation, featuring essays on the next 50 years of computing by luminaries and pioneers in the field. The ACM 97 conference was chaired by Robert Metcalf and emceed by James Burke. Details on how to obtain more information on ACM 97 follow this program. Ladies and gentlemen, James Burke. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Very nice to be here. This conference is going to look at the next 50 years, and in doing so, it's going to be examining the process of change in a field that has already generated more change in the last 50 years than perhaps in the whole of history that went before. And that rate of change is accelerating. Out where I come from, in the world of ordinary users, that accelerating rate of change can often leave people confused, when by the time you've got round to reading the manual these days, the model is already obsolete, if you can understand the manual in the first place. Now, the attitude which this situation engenders always reminds me of the story of the depressive who gets a few days off from the clinic, goes to the beach to get himself a tan. A couple of days later, back in the hospital, his psychiatrist gets a postcard from his patient. The message on the card from the depressive often fits the attitude of the average user to what the computer industry is throwing at them every day because the message on the card reads, having a wonderful time, why? <laughs> the problem is, of course, that second-guessing change so you're ready for it, which is, I suppose, what this conference is all about, can often be difficult because of the serendipitous way in which change itself happens and the number of wildly different inputs that can often be involved in that process. Let me give you a quick example from my own field, the history of technology. Take the case of this, the toilet roll. Now, we know that when the Chinese invented paper, this was probably not the first thing they had in mind for the use of the brilliant invention. No, the history of paper is not an ineluctable move over the centuries towards the bathroom. The continuous roll paper production system that makes this roll possible arrives in England in the early mid-19th century, just when the cholera epidemic and new sewage systems and vitreous China lavatories put the idea of hygiene into people's heads. But the continuous roll process itself only gets there in the first place because some guys are accidentally out in France and they pick up the patent for it while buying the patent for something else they had really got in mind, which was a patent for a food preservation system invented by a champagne bottler in France to feed Napoleon's armies, who are winning their wars with highly mobile horse artillery made possible thanks to lightweight cannon, made possible thanks to a new cannon boring machine invented by an Englishman using a new kind of steel for the cutting head. Now, the steel is invented a little bit earlier in order to provide a better clock spring for navigators because when you're going west to exploit the colonists, <laughs> we, we saw nothing wrong with taxation without representation. <laughs> the BBC wouldn't function without it. <laughs> okay. Anyway, you need to know when you're doing that what time it is back at base 
If you know that, you know how much later the sun came up locally and therefore what time zone you're in. Now, the development of a new navigational gizmo to let them do that with a spring called Harrison's Chronometer was triggered in the first place by a gigantic prize offered by the British Parliament after a certain admiral with the wonderful name of Sir Cloudsley Shovel who is on his way back to England one foggy night in 1707 and makes a serious navigational boo-boo and hits the rocks and the whole fleet and him and all these men go down and all drown. So it could be said that the toilet roll comes from serious 18th century navigational problems. But look at the inputs all the way that move events towards the emergence of this humble object. Navigation technology, clocks, steel, artillery, food preservation, disease, vitreous china, and sewage systems. You see what I mean about it being hard to second guess the process of change that we are all here to talk about. The other thing that gives this conference particular relevance has to do with the subject of the conference itself, of course, computers. I mean, it is a truism, isn't it, that because of information technology, we stand today on the threshold of a social and scientific revolution, the like of which will make everything that went before look like slow motion. What makes it all the more challenging to forecast what that revolution will bring is the fact that all advances in information technology through history seem to cause a kind of explosion of innovation that in turn causes unforeseen secondary effects that ripple out in all directions. I mean, the alphabet seems to come up in a place called Serabit el Khadim down on the Sinai Peninsula around 1500 BC, primarily as a system for simplifying the various forms of hieroglyphic gobbledygook used by the various communities around, so that the, the guys running the mine, the Phoenician mining contractors who have a, a turquoise franchise from the Egyptians, can do easier deals with everybody. However, then, according to some scholars, the way the alphabet is read left to right, so it hits the right eye first, so it's processed by the left brain, that's the bit good at analysis and sequential operations, that makes it possible for the Greeks to use alphabetic thinking to develop logic and the reductionist thought processes that break the universe down into its smallest components and eventually give birth to the specialist gobbledygook now spoken by any PhD whose subject is not your own. <laughs> and the concomitant modern problem of change generated by people whose prime aim is to know more and more about less and less. A pal of mine at Oxford, for example, got his doctorate in Milton's use of the comma. <laughs> and, and, and take print, take print. I mean, take 17th century printed maps, okay? Printed maps. But what they did was encourage voyages of exploration that needed all kinds of new things to be invented for the purpose and as a result. New land registers to raise the backers money with, new mortgage companies to facilitate that, new joint stock companies to take the risk out of the investment, and through them, a stock market to trade those stocks on, run by a new national bank, providing finance through new credit agencies for new enterprises running on another new thing called a business contract, whose mutual obligation clauses inspired the constitution of another new thing called the United States of America. So there seem to be two key patterns to be aware of. The sometimes quite marginal areas in which the, the domino effect of one field of innovation can cause quite major effects in another field, and the powerful innovation ripple effect, if you like, spreading out around each advance in the field of information and communications technology. A third element in this process by which change changes life seems to be in the way things get gradually less monolithic. In the past, there wasn't much room for other than a single right way to do things, or get boiling oil, thumb screwed, barbecued, or whatever. But gradually, information technology has made it a less monolithic world because each advance created more and more things for people to be and to do. I'm tempted to risk the wrath of one of our particularly eminent speakers and wonder if there's not a parallel between that and what happens in nature when major environmental change strikes. When the most successful organisms to survive, the ones that develop what, beyond what you might describe as the primeval Southern California life form, you know, lie on the beach, get born, lie on the beach, die, <laughs> those successful ones seem to survive because of their ability to handle change by developing varieties of themselves so that whatever happens, however tough things get, one variety of the species will survive and through that, the species. 
I wonder if information technology doesn't give us the ability to do that same trick, to become, as a society, more complex and through diversity, develop a more flexible response to change repertoire and therefore survive better. Because if that is true, then what you're going to do over the next 50 years is cause an explosion of individualism that will put every institution under threat. Because as one of our speakers will be telling you, institutions are not built for flexibility and fast change. There's a great example of how hard institutions can fight change that I'd like to give you from the history of technology. All that stuff back in the 12th century, when the European economy recovers from the so-called dark ages, is generally put down to the arrival of new textile technology in the form of a new loom. The thing about the new loom is it has foot pedals, frees up the weaver's hands to throw the shuttle back and forward, weave much more cloth, much more quickly, much more cheaply. The well-established European traditional weavers' unions smash every one of these new looms they can find on the grounds that it will, quote, put people out of work, unquote, remarkably modern thinking for the 12th century. However, a generation later, when the dust has settled, market forces mean the loom is in use. And now the thread makers can't keep up, and they're making trouble. Until the answer comes in in the form of the spinning wheel from China, makes thread fast enough to keep up, put the wheel and the loom together, and the production of cloth goes up like a rocket. More riots. Because now, for a mass market, the cloth is linen, made from plants because they're cheap, rather than wool, made from sheep because they're expensive. So the rioters this time are in the well-established woolen industry. However, market forces mean that soon everybody's wearing this new cheap cloth, and when they wear it out, throwing it away. So all over 14th century Europe, there's this gigantic and growing pile of linen rag. So the price of paper drops like a stone. Linen rag is the best raw material you can have, and it's now free. More riots. The woolen industry again, because parchment is sheepskin, and now it's too expensive to use. However, here we are with enough paper to stick on the walls, the scribes are overworked and in demand, and pretty soon the old established professional writers' guilds are going on strike for higher wages, because in the meantime it has become a seller's market. The Black Death has knocked off two-thirds of the population of Europe, the other one-third is inheriting like crazy, and there's not enough writing ability to go around for all the documentation necessary. <laughs> Until Gutenberg solves the problem by automating it with a printing press around 1450. Riots in that greatest of old established institutions, the Vatican. The Pope needs a printing press like a hole in the head because it will encourage what we would call free thinking. Until somebody realizes that you can use the printing press to print indulgences with. Now, <clears throat> now for those non-Catholics among you, an indulgence was a kind of spiritual credit note. <laughs> Pay now, sin later. Anyway, with all the demand for printed salvation that follows, Rome makes a million money to build the Vatican, pay Michelangelo's bill, and generally get involved in certain prestige projects that make certain German clerics madder than hell at this cash and carry view of salvation. One of whom nails up a few mild remarks on the subject, and there, thanks to advances in textile technology and fought by institutions all the way, is the Reformation. It's a trifle oversimplified, but you get my drift. <laughs> Institutionalized thinking. What, what I'm saying is, institutionalized thinking doesn't like unexpectedly new ways of doing things. Like the lady in the hotel elevator, a man gets in, she doesn't know, the doors close, they start to rise. He says, your room or mine, baby. And she says, if you're going to argue about it, forget it. <laughs> what I'm saying is, that there is a built-in accident waiting to happen between this industry and what it's going to do over the next 50 years and the major social structures. I mean, when a manager in Boise, Idaho, is using a Japanese corporate satellite to run CAD-CAM units in Argentina the way the London accountants say the Taiwan headquarters wants using software uplinked live from Sydney, what happens to national sovereignty? The final area of change to be aware of besides the domino effect of innovation the key importance of information technology and the way things get more complicated is, I suppose, what you might call the user effect, the way the marketplace can influence the direction of innovation. And you don't need to be a PhD to be a user with influence. James Watt's pump might never have done other than drain a few mines had it not been for the surge in the population with cash in their pockets and a desire for metal pots and pans that kicked off the Industrial Revolution. Or the thousands of people who just didn't like the Ford Edsel. 
These world-changing consumer decisions don't result from debates and focus groups. Individuals make individual choices all by themselves. But if it happens a million times over, and it can, it changes everything. Theoretically, that's what we all do at elections. OK, we have some good speakers for you, great speakers for you, and they have some very provocating, provocative and exciting things to say uh, on the way about the industry and what it's capable of doing over the next 50 years, and I thank them for taking on this task. We'll kick off with Gordon Bell talking about what we all want to know about, the law of prediction. He's followed by Carver Mead, who's going to be looking at semiconductors and whether or not we can expect Moore's law to go on operating through to 2047. Next comes Joel Birnbaum with a challenging look at the alternate types of computing that lie ahead and which is likely to predominate. He's followed by Patty Mass to discuss what you might describe as your future significant other, aka the electronic agent. Next comes Nathan Mervold on the matter of software and who's going to be doing it, or rather what's going to be doing it. And today ends with fun and frolic and who knows what from the world of 21st century entertainment in the form of Bran Ferron from Disney. Tomorrow, we open with a look ahead to whether or not we'll be there in 2047, with a look from ex-Secretary of Defense William Perry, <laughs> who'll be talking about computer and war. I don't know why you're laughing. <laughs> then comes former uh, Finance Minister to Chile, Fernando Flores, who's talking about the impact of information technology on your business and how deals will be done 50 years from now. <clears throat> Next, Vint Cerf, with an intriguing look at a future <clears throat> where the internet and computing are invisible, pervasive, and everywhere. Brenda Laurel follows Vint with a very provocative look, look at computers in culture in a way that I think will surprise and excite you. Immediately after lunch tomorrow, we have my countryman, Morris Wilkes, who wrote the first book on computer programming and whose talk is called What's to Come is Still Unsure. What it's about exactly, I'm still unsure. Then comes Elliot Soloway on what the computer industry is going to do to education between now and 2047 and at the very different world of qualification that that may bring. Finally, tomorrow, Reid Hunt, FCC chairman, talking about what telecommunications is going to do to education and most other things. On Wednesday, the final conference day is a short one. It starts with a presentation by that well-known science fiction writer, Bruce Sterling, who, by the way, suggested that the best way to use the polling paddles was to see if you could do the Mexican wave. So you can guess his prediction is going to be far from predictable. After him comes Raj Reddy, out on a limb with teleportation, time travel, and immortality. And last, but very far from least, Nobel Prize winner in quantum chromodynamics, Murray Gell-Mann, will address the complex matter of the convergence of physics, biology, and information technology, a subject that in itself, by almost by definition, kind of wraps it all up. So after Murray, that's the end. The following is a keynote speaker presentation from the ACM 97 conference, The Next 50 Years of Computing. ACM 97 brought together over 2,000 leaders and luminaries from all aspects of the computing world to discuss and predict what the next 50 years of computing has in store. ACM 97 underwriters were Computer World, Hewlett Packard, Intel, Microsoft, and Sun Microsystems. Sponsors were Cadmus Journal Services, IBM, Netscape, Popular Science, Sheridan Printing Company Incorporated, Silicon Graphics Incorporated, SoftBank, and Unisys. The event also included a major exposition with a paleotechnic look back to the future from the year 2047, and a specially commissioned book, Beyond Calculation, featuring essays on the next 50 years of computing by luminaries and pioneers in the field. The ACM 97 conference was chaired by Robert Metcalf and emceed by James Burke. Details on how to obtain more information on ACM 97 follow this program. Ladies and gentlemen, James Burke. Our first speaker is known throughout the industry, although I'm sure he has mixed feelings about this, as the father 
of the mini-computer. And I guess he is the embodiment of that saying, you only know where you're going if you know where you've been. Because he's been a very significant part of the industry since the very early days. So when he talks, as he will, about the matter of predicting, his views are grounded in considerable experience of doing just that. In his 23 years, for instance, as vice president of R&D at Digital Equipment Corporation. He was educated at MIT, and from 66 to 72 was professor of computer science and engineering at Carnegie Mellon. From 86 to 87, he was the first assistant director of the National Science Foundation's Computing Directorate. He led the National Research Network panel that became the NIIGII, <clears throat> and he was author of the first High Performance Computer and Communications Initiative. Today, he's an industry, industry consultant at large and senior researcher at Microsoft, concerned principally with telepresence. So you could say he's been around the block. He's written numerous books and papers on computer structure and startup companies, and in 91, he published High Tech Ventures, The Guide to Entrepreneurial Success. So you may want to take notes. Currently, he's on the board and technical advisory boards of Ambit, Adaptive Solutions, Cirrus Logic, DES, Fake Space, University of Video Communications, and others. He's also director of the Bell Mason Group, supplying expert systems for venture development to startups, investors, governments, and entrepreneurial initiatives. His very many awards include the IEEE von Neumann Award and the National Medal of Technology for, quote, his continuing intellectual and industrial achievements in the field of computer design and for his leading role in establishing computers that serve as a significant tool for engineering, science, and industry. I suppose what that all adds up to is you're about to hear it from the horse's mouth. On a subject we are all, aren't we, desperate to get right, the subject of getting it right, prediction about the future. The title of his talk, and this is where you can tell he's got a handle on the matter, the title of his talk is The Laws of Prediction. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Gordon Bell. Uh, thank you, James. And I'd like to start by uh, thanking Bob Metcalf for supplying me the title of this talk. Uh, I, I like to begin with my uh, first uh, post uh, Babbage, uh, post uh, Turing, and uh, pre computer industry prediction that's probably the most famous, and that is that uh, the size of the market by, uh, for computers uh, that occurred. And from that, we can deduce uh, uh, one of the laws. Let's look at that one of these first computers that IBM built. This is the left half of that computer. Uh, this is an 80 foot long computer that was built uh, at at, for Harvard by IBM under Harvard uh, Aiken's design. And what we can gain from that is that essentially predictions require some history. Watson had no history in that. Uh, there, it wasn't really, we didn't really call it a computer then. And uh, it was a great prediction because that held for 10 years. The market was about that size for a number of years. So. Uh, basically, I will say that you need some form of history, uh, even if it's a scientific event, uh, that, to make a prediction. Uh, my favorite set of uh, predictions come from a book that I read sort of, uh, for amusement from time to time, this, and this is a Navy Delphi panel of experts. Uh, I, don't, that, uh, I, I don't know who, who was on that committee, but they made a very accurate prediction about the card reader. Uh, that was then running, I think, th at, at about 2,000 cards a minute, uh, they predicted that, it would, that it would, its use would decline, and they were uh, right on on that. Uh, they also predicted that uh, advances in various memories would, would give us large memories on the order of four megabytes. Uh, now, what happened, and a person working for me, Henry Lemire, uh, said that we'll still be making cores in 1980. Now, what happened is a technology came from out of nowhere and wiped everybody out. Uh, MOS memories came in then, and now what we know as Moore's Law is that every four years we get a, a factor, or if every three years we get a factor of four or 60% a year. So that we started in 71 or 72 with the 
uh, one, one K memory, and if you run that out to 2010, as some people have done, that gets us up to eight, eight gigabytes for a single memory at that point in time. Uh, now, not to be outdone, while we've got Moore's Law working on our side, there's uh, been a recent uh, a storage of a single electron in a seven nanometer by seven nanometer uh, cell uh, at the University of Minnesota, and uh, uh, Nathan Mirvold uh, has noted that, in fact, if we could just run that out, we could get two and a half petabytes on a chip. Uh, and uh, that would accelerate Moore's law by 30 years, by the way. So uh, potentially we, we, ha we, we can, th uh, can have, it, even Moore's law can be accelerated potentially, if physics is with us. Now let's look at, uh, when I started talking, thinking about this, I said, what, what, why is it, why, do you, why would you want to predict anyway? And, and uh, probably, uh, I think one of the most useful is a vision and a challenge. Moore's law is such a, a challenge and a vision. Uh, uh, Vannevar Bush's 1945 article on as we may uh, think is a, another vision uh, uh, and a challenge to the scientific community. Uh, the uh, other reason is in fact that, uh, well, MBA schools say you have to plan and avoid, and so you can avoid surprises. So. Uh, and then once you start planning, why then you get a budget and you have to maintain this budget. So that's, that's the next, uh, 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 the, the, uh, uh, the top, top reason. Uh, the other one, which many of you know, is that you have to predict so that you can extract great gobs of money from, uh, from the federal government. Uh, for example, uh, if uh, now, now that we've got a teraflop, we need a petaflop, and so if we had a teraflop, petaflop, we could uh, uh, build a bomb or not build a bomb or go to the moon or not go to the moon or simulate the moon, whatever it is. And uh, the other thing is, in fact, it's to create grand challenges for ourselves, and of course the grand challenge is mostly to perpetuate our, our own funding so that we can keep doing what we did. Um, the uh, next reason is, uh, is for uh, for really business, business plans, and, and you now have to do it for, for your grants that you receive. One that I think is particularly amusing is the, uh, the, the part where you get predictions that, that you actually pay people to predict a new market that you're entering, such as uh, pen-based computing or video on demand. So you actually pay people to create uh, a, a, a plan or a vision for a new business. Uh, you have no idea that it's going to be there, and then you go out and use that plan that you've paid for to then go raise funny money uh, that that uh, makes the vision come true. And then, actually, people do it and get paid for it. Um, and then, and as we're doing right here, it's really to celebrate an anniversary and to have a conference. So that's that's really uh, 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 the greatest example. And now, one of the reasons I like to do it is I like to bet. Uh, you know, I don't, I've never been to Las Vegas, and uh, this is just a way of doing it and earn a little money on the side. This is a $100, uh, uh, I'm not telling you who it was because he paid me. Uh, everybody else I will identify. Uh, and this was a bet on whether AT&T would have been able to buy NCR and uh, have, have the two entities survive. Uh, uh, this is a, a bet that I intend to collect this evening uh, by Raj Reddy and uh, Ed Lazowska, a 92 bet that video on demand would be available and operating at a very large scale uh, in the, uh, uh, by, by actually last October. So essentially winners get fed here. Um, this is a bet, now I'm on, those others I was on the, uh, was betting against the optimist. Here I'm the optimist and I'm betting against uh, my boss, Jim Gray, uh, that there will be video phones in use uh, by 2001. Very sh these are all very short-term predictions. So, I mean, this doesn't get us very far in the 2047 bit. But uh, anyway, it's a, a way to look at who can predict or how you predict and what ones are going to come. And uh, at least I've got a downside. Uh, I win either way in there. I guess we both win either way. In one case, I eat crow. The other, uh, other case, I eat good food. Uh, by publishing paper. Uh, 
So essentially, what can we do un understand is a law that comes out of a lot of these predictions, and that is really, for, for short-term predictions, bet against the optimists. They're very likely to belong to be wrong, and particularly the as far, bet against people who are far away from reality uh, and actually have to do it. Um, in longer term uh, predictions, why science is a really good indicator, and uh, here I cite Carver's 11-year uh, rule, which says that it's going to take 11 years from the first uh, sort of bread border observation of a phenomena to the, to the point where that can be a commercial success. And then, essentially, the one that uh, you can always bet against is organizations will really behave poorer than anyone uh, could ever predict. Uh, and sort of the larger, the, uh, the, the more predictably unpredictable. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, I, in, starting, in, gather, in gathering data for this talk, I uh, was able to find, uh, or my wife was able to find a 25-year-old future of computing talk that I, I gave at MIT, a videotape, so it's on record. I like to go on record on these things because uh, with predictions, you never, you've got to really calibrate wh wh what you know about, about that and whether you're right or wrong. Um, and, and the first prediction was future computers would be both cheaper and, and faster. Uh, and that was a model, uh, model that I, I posit here and I posit for you in terms of a, a way of predicting, a, a way of, that we should use for predicting. Uh, the other one was that, gee, it looked to me like semiconductor companies were going to be the ones who actually make the computers the way it was going. This uh, was right after the introduction of the first uh, microprocessor. And then another prediction was, in fact, we badly needed networks because otherwise what we were doing was people were becoming the networks. And then the other one, the final one, was about semiconductor uh, evolution. And I saw it was just going to go on for six more years and then stop. Uh, so a prediction that very often comes out of this is pro progress is really going to continue just for six more years and flatten out. And that's because uh, it's really a two-generational thing. You're working on a uh, products take maybe three years or so uh, to get out and, and understand. And so uh, that's really one generation beyond the one you're working on. So you see what you're doing now, you can just barely do it, and then somebody's working on one that you can imagine that that one would work. And so what you want to do is separate, and you're looking at predictors here, who's making it as an engineer or a scientist, uh, because if you're, if you're actually doing it, you tend to be uh, quite conservative. This is uh, not, I don't know, maybe a prediction, a statement that uh, Jim Gray and observation that Jim Gray and I have made, which is everything cyberizable will be in cyberspace uh, by pick whatever. And that's really kind of our quest. Now, with that uh, very 10 minute warm up, let me talk about what I'm going to say a little more about. And that's really cyberspace, which is a combination of three, fa uh, three factors the platforms, uh, the networks that connect them, and then cyberization, which is the process of taking uh, information about everything and putting it in, into the platforms and putting content on those platforms. Uh, I'll, I, have, I can't resist giving some more laws of failed prediction because I, uh, I'm going to give you, maybe end up with the top 15 here. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, as m those of you who know me, I can't help but use exponentials for predicting, uh, because th that, that you can do with either a one or a, two data points, you can sort of do anything, um, and I do. Uh, and, then, uh, and then talk about some of the computers we might predict as a warm up for our uh, paddle, uh, paddle process. So was, let's look at cyberization, which is really, it's an interface to uh, all of the bits and, and process information every in the, in, everywhere in the world, which is, which at, one might look at the, the graphical user interface or a WIMP interface or a speak interfaces, that's cyberization, or a, or a, uh, a hard implant. Uh, those are all cyberization where we're taking the information processor uh, and connecting that to some physical uh, uh, being. Uh, it includes just the pure bits, uh, such as the, this conference, the uh, books, 
uh, newspapers and things like that. It includes bit tokens, uh, which is in fact the money and all the contracts that will be there. Uh, and it includes the state of everything, uh, whether it's uh, people, places, and things. And then finally, uh, all the networks that we have, uh, uh, highway networks, uh, power grids, uh, uh, and water, and what, what everything. So we're going to be, this is where we're heading. Is that a, uh, is that a challenge or what? And I kind of think of it's really a, based on our quest, our scientific quest to understand, and then suddenly with, uh, with those observations that becomes a goal and fate. Uh, so cyberization is this combination of platforms and whatever. And this is my rendition of cyberspace, which is really a fractal uh, network of networks of networks that start with, uh, uh, the, I didn't have space for the universe there, but the universe going down to bodies and cars and, and home, homes where everything become, where, uh, where you are having everything connected uh, in this fractal a fractal network. One of the key questions that I think we, uh, we're, that I'm excited about, that I think we want to look at, is: Is that going to be one network for data? Is it going to be a uh, second network uh, that we have now for telephony, and then the third network, or will all all of those networks merge into a single uh, single dial tone, which uh, I think we would all like to have? Uh, so, really, cyber cyberspace is really a quest of moving in in out of the uh, these three dimensions of communication, that is networking and computation, which uh, we tend to focus on as, an, as a, a society, and cyberization, that interface to uh, the physical world. And then on top of that, I would put probably a layer there, a fourth dimension, uh, which is in fact con content rides all of those or enables all of that. Because that's really what it's all about. It's really the content that's, that uh, this infrastructure is, is dealing with. So some more laws of failed predictions. Uh, uh, I'd like to go back to my uh, uh, former boss of mine uh, who predicted uh, about uh, there wasn't, wasn't really any reason to have computers in the home. Uh, this was about 10 years after uh, I was, had a bunch of experiments going on with various people of computer at DEC doing computers in the home. Uh, he then went on to predict Unix's snake oil. Uh, a true statement, of course, but... Uh, Unfortunately, everybody was into buying snake oil, and he didn't brand his, his very well. Uh, and then uh, a more recent prediction is that he certainly wouldn't put his company on the, on the internet. Uh, I don't know that he knew he was on there. So here's a law that comes out of that. Equating yourself to the average user is not a good idea unless you're an average user. And here I am with the average man, which has exactly the same dimensions as myself, uh, or it did a few years ago, and uh, and uh, I can so I can prove it. So so trust me. Uh, but on the other hand, don't trust anybody who says trust that. Uh, we all have these wonderful going back to our '69 predictions of uh, certainly voice was going to be in by '78 and simple sentences by '75. Uh, and then uh, an earlier prediction than that was a 1962 prediction that by the head of the RCA labs that speech was going to be commercialized. And he outlined a speech typewriter that took in uh, uh, data from microphone and produced pages, and then it was going to trend, and then another version translated it, and then, a, and then finally a third version was a translated speech version. So essentially, uh, speech predictions are optimistic and have been uh, wrong. They all, always tend to tend to be wrong. My prediction was uh, 20 years was that it would occur in 80. That was after I spent a year in speech and said, "Holy hell, I don't want to be in this business. This is going to this is a 20-year problem." Well, I was wrong. It was a it, it was a 40-year problem, which is about where I am on on my predictions. Uh, factor of two. Um, anyway, mobs and a and especially committees uh, predict poorly. Uh, a friend of mine uh, at, who was head of uh, long lines in 1981 before the uh, breakup was that ISDN would be ubiquitous, and he claims that that was the problem. 
And unfortunately, I'll go out on the limb and I'll say, unfortunately, ISDN is still likely to become the ubiquitous connection, uh, but by, clearly by default. It's not something we, any of us are anxious to have, but in fact, there is there, the, the depressing, if I want to cast a depressing pall on this, it's going to be in the communication line, and it's only because I've worked in this area so long. And this prediction is that network bandwidth certainly doesn't becomes available uh, uh, more uh, slowly than anyone can uh, can ever predict. So beware of predictions about bandwidth is free. And in fact, bandwidth is free. Uh, you just can't get any of it at that price. Uh, <laughs> and from that, we really underestimate the power of large companies and planners, lawyers, and governments to foul up any predictions, uh, particularly of these involved infrastructure, where we, but if you really want to foul up, uh, it requires an econometric model. I won't give you the data of this one that showed the high performance computing uh, initiative was going to uh, help with the, the deficit and the trade deficit and I think cure cancer and everything else. But uh, this was ba really based on a numerical econometric model. So the university and the model will remain anonymous. Uh, another Delphi panel was certainly parallel processing was coming in by 75. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Cray, Cray 1, one could say is it did. Uh, this is a, this is, I'll identify this one uh, because he hasn't paid off yet. Uh, this is a bet that I had with Danny Hillis, uh, which was in 95, uh, computers with massively parallel computers would do most of the scientific uh, processing. Um, and then, uh, at, pri actually prior to that time, uh, that was based on a, on a DARPA initiative, which was that we would see a uh, 50 times list machine. Might have seen that if the company hadn't gone out of business. Um, a thousand node multiprocessor, which in fact occurred uh, not in 89 as I predicted, but, or was uh, asked to build, but in fact ab about 92, uh, and is now finally there. The interesting thing is all of the, all of the predictable, uh, all of those projects failed going back and looking at it. Uh, on the other hand, this is a, uh, a, a wonderful, there's been wonderful results here in, in high performance computing. We've, we've got a factor of, of 2,000 speed up. We've seen that. You, get, you can get 100 by Moore's law. Uh, you can get a factor of two by spending more. Uh, making bigger machines, instead of spending a mere $30 million, you can spend $100 million now for a supercomputer. And then finally, uh, the switch from ECL technology to CMOS technology. And now the DOE is, uh, has an accelerated, remember that was an SCI, this is the ASCI program, and this is petaflops by 2010. Hey, good prediction, I think. Uh, sure is possible. Moore's law could get you 100 to, to 450. You can spend more, instead of, instead of capping the spending at a mere $100 million, you spend $500 million for, for a super, uh, for a super computer, a massively parallel thing. Uh, you centralize all the three DOE centers into one place, and that gets you a factor of three there, or you have, uh, al alternatively, the network is good enough to do that, and by, by more competition, you could get another 3x. So, so essentially, we can, can get there, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, in a funny way, a law that really comes out parallel line, as you would expect, parallel, you never get there. It's always a constant distance uh, away with, with parallelism. So uh, this is a Bill Wolf prediction, uh, uh, which is there. It's really not. It's hardly to say it's a prediction. It's a vision that, in fact, uh, one would uh, envision millions of hosts in a loose uh, confederation, and then uh, users will look. That'll look like a big desktop computer. Wow, that's a real desktop computer. Uh, but. From that, we can note that essentially predictions are easy, especially about parallelism. Doing is really hard. And finally, predictions about parallelism were risky. Uh, but now they're predictable because you essentially just, you find some problem that can be parallelized. It may only be the diagnostic for this parallel computer, but nevertheless, you can run it at, at, uh, at full speed. Uh, and one of the nicest predictions now, uh, now really uh, virtually 50 years ago was the Bush's uh, uh, paper on as we may think, and that was that he really held out for us that there's, 
this statement about there's always going to be lots of things to compute, so we've got a good, 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 good area to work in here. And then the outline mimics, which uh, uh, many people think as the was the vision for the uh, uh, for the World Wide Web. Matchbook sized uh, uh, half dollar encyclo or uh, five cent encyclopedias. Well, factor of about a factor of eight and a half inflation. So for about 50 cents today uh, is what it costs to make a uh, an CD encyclopedia. Speech to text, wrong there. Head mounted camera, yeah, here it is. Uh, here's Steve Mann in cyberspace with his head mounted camera and all. Uh, he's working on trying to make it a little better now, for, a little hard to sleep in that. Um, and uh, on that, what I deduce essentially faith in science and, and a vision here can be used as a, as a good predictor, I would say, but really being Vannevar Bush and really lucky because none of the technology that he outlined was in fact the way that it happened. The transistor came in and saved him two years later. Uh, I don't know that he saw that. And then finally, uh, I, uh, I prefer the, gee, it's nice to have at least one data point when you're starting to predict. So uh, predicting with data, uh, is, now let's look at when predicting with exponential data, but be, the, the neat thing is beware of how you use these things. Uh, here's, the, here's the four basics of exponential data. Uh, on the uh, linear on the left and exponential on the, and log on the right. Uh, basically, we just get more over time. Uh, new overtakes old, uh, things get cheaper, and newer and cheaper wins. Uh, so Bob Lucky, a couple of, uh, of years ago, said, my God, if we couldn't predict the web, what good are we? So uh, I'll, I'll use that maybe as a, uh, we should use that. So exponentials, uh, the problem with them is that you can't see them coming. Here's, here's if, you, if you would look at, uh, at what might happen uh, with internet's growth, uh, then that crossover somewhere around uh, 2003 is that there are more interneters uh, out there than there are people. Uh, well, that's no big deal because essentially you haven't gotten the light switch market, the uh, camera market, and all that, the dog market. You know, all of these people, all these things are going to be on the on the web. Now you get that just from you know, hey, I did that with. Uh, actually four data points there, which was how many interneters were out there and an observation they were doubling every year, looking at the world population uh, and then uh, it, and its growth rate. And so that's, you obviously get that at that time. Uh, in the mean, uh, Negroponte predicts that, uh, gee, there will be a, a, giga, a giga people out there uh, by 2000 using the web. That's, I think, a little bit high. That's more than there are PCs. That's less than there are are tele or about what there are in t t TVs and, and phones, so we need radio links or whatever to get, get there. So I uh, don't know whether that's going to be a good prediction or not. Um, now let's go look at sort of what's, what generally is going to happen. Carver will give you the real, real poop here. Uh, in honor of Morris uh, Wilkes, this was uh, the EDSAC memory, uh, 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 um, acoustic memory that was used for storage in EDSAC in 49. Uh, EDSAC uh, ran at uh, 700 instructions a second, and then that little uh, glitch going up there in 51, 52 was the computer started running in the 50,000 instruction a second rate uh, when by going parallel and getting rid of the serial memories. And then that, that grew over time. And depending on what data point you take as your first and last, I don't want to be bothered with any of this intermediate data point stuff because then you get into all kinds of statistical correlation and you lose sight of all this, this stuff. So um, uh, I, I, only use two, I only like two data points or, uh, when, when doing predictions. Uh, Otherwise, the data it tends to, you, you, get, you get too many arguments. Um, anyway, this is uh, 20, uh, depending on what data point you use when you start, if you use Morris's machine, and depending on what you look at now, whether you take real applications performance or, or uh, other, or uh, manufacturer's performance, why you get anywhere from 20 to 40% growth a year. If we, uh, memory parallels, parallels that, storage parallels that, and in fact, uh, and then the backbone, the uh, networking uh, uh, parallel, all those lines in terms of, of uh, uh, our data. 
And uh, the other, and coming in here as a dead heat for last is the uh, uh, telephony service. This is, this is, uh, this, if I had to say, what's our limit it is being able to access uh, it's the network. And that is, that 17% is really 15%. And the, the uh, lines above those is whether or not we uh, start to develop some bandwidth that's available in homes. Microprocessor performance, if you now, instead of taking, let's take a very optimistic line, and that's uh, peak advertised performance, and that really pretty much follows Moore's law. But if you look at the real application performance, it's more like 40% uh, a year from that. So the question is, are we going to have 20%, which would get us uh, to a mere teraops uh, for our uh, uh, onboard computers? Will it be petaops or will it be exaops? Uh, as we go out, and uh, that's just a slight change in, in the exponent from, uh, from 20 to 60 percent. New overtakes old. Uh, this is a, a famous going down how, how you get in trouble uh, line. This was uh, bipolar technology uh, that was used when we introduced fax in 78, and then uh, uh, we see CMOS came in to take that over. Things get cheaper. Uh, computers uh, form uh, from, uh, from the bottom, uh, from the top as constantly improved uh, performance, and then from the bottom of lower, new, new lower price computers form. That theme, that model, which I posited in 72, is the model by which everything uh, contends, continues to happen. Newer and cheaper uh, wins. Nope, never. The mainframe is dead. That's been predicted so many times I couldn't even uh, get those. Uh, but uh, it still is here and just to hold our legacy data. So what can we really predict about computers? Certainly one I predicted a, a few years ago was a network computer. Uh, and I was assured by my friends at Microsoft and Intel that no one wanted a, anything that didn't cost $2,000. Um, and then system on a memory. Uh, chip uh, a system on a chip industry with memory and processing all that together is forming now. Uh, the home area network is here, uh, and then we, we're talking about the various forms of body area networks and things that we can have running uh, on board. Uh, here are computers that are already out there, some of the CMU computers that were uh, the wearables in the second wearable conference. Uh, this is a thing I'm particularly interested in, having had two uh, heart attacks, is that uh, a uh, cardioplastic implant where a piece of the muscle from the back is wrapped around the heart, and then you simply uh, pulse that, and the, this muscle becomes part of your heart uh, again. Um, and then uh, what some of the experts predict as bionics in, uh, recently was the cochlear implants, which are already occurring, uh, bionic limbs by 2013, whatever those are, artificial vision, uh, that's going to take a leap of, of something because you have to couple, couple into all those little fiber optics. And no bionic person is, uh, or bionic uh, person they thought was unlikely, whatever that was. And then finally, uh, some observations about predicting, and that was uh, certainly existence proofs are essential, otherwise it's sort of faith and dumb luck. Uh, numbers and, and data and models are really our friend. You really should figure out how, how, it can, how could it really happen, and then bet on predictors who are grounded, uh, intuitive, imaginative, and lucky. Uh, if you want short-term predictions, go to engineers. If you want longer-term predictions, go to scientists who've been lucky and, and who are doing it. And then finally, uh, because it can it, uh, or could doesn't mean it will. And then finally, uh, it's really usually just the economics that, uh, that stop it from all happening. So uh, in the future, uh, I see that everything is going to be in cyberspace. Uh, this, is a, this conference is one that uh, th three companies, Precept is, is putting out on the uh, Mbone, uh, Microsoft and VXtreme are uh, we'll have all the conference on the, uh, uh, out there on the web uh, uh, for use from now until uh, 2047. And so my prediction is that we will not be gathered together in the, or, or not we, but those of you who will be at the 2047 conference, it will be in, in cyberspace, not real space. Thank you.
The preceding was excerpted from the ACM 97 conference presentations. ACM is the first and the world's largest professional society in computing. For additional speaker presentations, more information about ACM 97, or how to become a member of ACM, please contact the ACM 97 website or contact ACM at this address. The following is a keynote speaker presentation from the ACM 97 conference, The Next 50 Years of Computing. ACM 97 brought together over 2,000 leaders and luminaries from all aspects of the computing world to discuss and predict what the next 50 years of computing has in store. ACM 97 underwriters were Computer World, Hewlett Packard, Intel, Microsoft, and Sun Microsystems. Sponsors were Cadmus Journal Services, IBM, Netscape, Popular Science, Sheridan Printing Company Incorporated, Silicon Graphics Incorporated, SoftBank, and Unisys. The event also included a major exposition with a paleotechnic look back to the future from the year 2047, and a specially commissioned book, Beyond Calculation, featuring essays on the next 50 years of computing by luminaries and pioneers in the field. The ACM 97 conference was chaired by Robert Metcalf and emceed by James Burke. Details on how to obtain more information on ACM 97 follow this program. Ladies and gentlemen, James Burke. Our next speaker is one of the industry's greatest teachers. So when he finishes, there will be a test. He's the Moore Professor of, applied, of Engineering and Applied Science at Caltech, where he's been since he got his PhD there in 1960. Now, he's a member of so many associations, I'll just mention a couple, the IEEE, the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Sciences, the Royal Swedish Academy of, of Engineering Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Franklin Institute. And his very many awards include the IEEE Centennial Medal for Extraordinary Achievement, as well as its von Neumann Medal for, quote, leadership and innovative contributions to VLSI and creative microelectronic structures. You'll gather from that he has something to do with VLSI. In fact, he pioneered the field. Today at Caltech, he focuses on modeling neuronal structures, and his latest book is entitled Analog VLSI and Neural Systems. So I suppose you could say he does a great deal of thinking about thinking. That's an English joke. I won't do another one. <laughs> I have no doubt, however, that its thinking is what you will be doing after you hear what he has to say, because he's going to speak about the future of semiconductors and that subject so close to everybody's forecast charts, how long will Moore's Law persist? A matter that may have some bearing on what you or your company may be up to, or not up to, in the relatively near future. Please join me in welcoming Carver Mead. I want to start by by reminding you of things that you all already know, many of you much better than I do. Uh, computation started with a, with a belief, basically, a, a conjecture uh, that any computation could be done by this funny thing we call a Turing machine. It's really just a model of computation, a, a, a thing that got made up in a person's head. It was actually a model of mathematicians proving theorems. Uh, so that's, that's an interesting thing. I have a little different view of, of uh, computable functions. Uh, I think computable functions really are the things that you can 
you can sit down and run on your PC or workstation or whatever. Now, I'm not the first person to, to think this. Uh, of course, that's an old idea, and there's a whole science of complexity theory which deals with all that. And it's interesting when you look at it. Uh, what do we believe about computing? Well, uh, at least from a scientific point of view, uh, we use the word time to mean how many steps it takes on our computer to do something. Uh, by space, we don't mean space. In the physicist sense, we mean uh, how much memory does it take to do this problem. And the assumption underneath all that really is that uh, all computers are basically alike uh, within some small factor. And once we've defined computers to be all alike, except for the year in which they were made, um, we can define a set of problems that are tractable, namely the ones we can run on our PC and it gets done before dinner. And uh, the intractable ones, uh, the ones that we run over the weekend and it still seems to be running, but we're not sure. Uh, we've all done things like that. Uh, those problems are characterized by a very large number of alternatives, uh, exponential in the worst case, and not any really good way to make shortcuts. And so the poor little thing sits there and just uh, struggles away with all that. And um, you know, this, this conference really is about congratulating ourselves on how we're changing the world and all that. Um, but I would like to uh, call attention to the fact that there are an interesting class of problems that we're not doing so well on. And that's why it's kind of interesting at a conference like this to, to talk about them. Um, most interesting optimization problems are like that. But what's really interesting is that all the perception problems are like that, hearing, uh, vision, any of those things. Now, that wouldn't be so bad if, I mean, none of us can do them on computer to first order. You saw in, in Gordon's talk that the failed predictions about any of the perception problems uh, kept failing and kept failing and kept failing and are still failing as we speak. Um, it wouldn't be so embarrassing if it weren't for the fact that all, even very dumb animals like the fly, do them very, very well. And that's embarrassing. That's really embarrassing. Well, from a point of view of, of us as people building computers, what if we could make a different kind of machine? What if we could make a machine where the capability, the computational capability, got bigger exponentially with the size of the machine instead of linearly or slightly sublinearly like it does today. Uh, that would be an interesting thing. That would be different. That would change the game. Because no longer would we be stuck in this thing where uh, we keep making these predictions. We're going to do speech recognition, or we're going to do artificial vision, or we're going to do these sort of artificial intelligence kinds of things. And it keeps not happening, and it keeps not happening because these problems are exponential. Or my colleagues always caution me and say, well, you know, many of these problems aren't really provably exponential. They may be just a very high power. Well, OK, very high power. That's all right. Um, well, this, is, this talk is sort of a personal confession of mine for my last 30 years of work. Could, could somewhere there be hiding a form of machine that would do something like this? Because that would be interesting. That wouldn't be just building one more machine. And there are some candidate structures. Uh, Ultra-parallel VLSI would be, would be interesting and might do something like that. Uh, neural computing structures we know do something like that because we use them to watch each other and do that sort of thing, listen to each other. And then there's a, a bunch of, of furor right now about quantum computing structures, and I'll say a couple of words about that uh, toward the end. Well, I, I worked a long time on ultra-parallel VLSI structures, and uh, as in so many things, there's some good news and some bad news. 
Uh, the good news is that we, yes, we finally learned how to design this stuff to where it uh, sometimes works on first silicon and it usually works on second silicon. And uh, they do some things very, very well and uh, that's all very nice, but the bad news is that the speed up is uh, polynomial at best and usually linear in the no amount of stuff that you, you put there. So what's going on? Well, let me once again insult everyone's intelligence and remind you uh, about digital systems because uh, I think nowhere in the literature on this conference was it said we were talking about digital systems, but I think most people here assume that that's what we're talking about. Uh, what is a digital system after all and, and why is it a good idea? Well, you all know what they are, but let it, let it be said one more time. Uh, digital systems represent information by a finite set of discrete symbols. That's not a new idea. It came from the invention of the alphabet, as you said, some 1500 years BC. And so it's not a new idea. So why is it such a big deal now? Uh, why did it take so long? Well, it's a good idea for a very simple reason. Let me give the sort of simplest, most brain dead example. If we have some information that starts out with a one or a zero, that's the simplest one that I know. And now that physical information, that's another thing that doesn't get said too much, that uh, in cyberspace it's somehow kind of hard to remember that there's a physics of stuff out there. Like the information has to get stored somewhere, it has to get transmitted through something, it has to be received by something and so forth. That's all physical stuff. And that physical stuff has its own properties, which tends to take a nice sharp distribution of ones and zeros and turn it into a distribution here, which is a little broader. Now, if you keep doing that step after step after step, the distributions go broader and broader and finally overlap and finally you, you lose the information. But never mind, what we do is we put the whole thing through a contractive mapping which is illustrated here by this uh, transfer curve for a logic element. And it comes out the other side as good as new. So that's the big deal about, about digital. And oh, by the way, there are a lot of more complex examples like error correcting codes and all, but they all rely on this discreteness of the underlying symbols to, to do that. Well, with that art form, we we congratulate ourselves on being able to do things so that we can reconstruct them perfectly, and rightly so. But it, the, the form itself carries with it some limitations. Well, if one is looking at doing something beyond the limitations, maybe one ought to look at what the limitations are. So um, what we mean by time, remember, was the number of steps of some machine going along. It didn't really have much to do with time. In fact, these machines don't really have a representation for time, per se, in any natural way. Um, the continuous variables, of course, have to be represented by numbers, uh, strings of these discrete symbols. And they have to get processed in discrete chunks, one at a time. So there's no notion of locality or continuity that we have in, in the physical world. And much of what goes on in the physical world is really simplified a great deal by the continuity that exists there. And that continuity is lost when we've digitized the information. So uh, all the alternative hypotheses for the solution to one of these exponential problems have to be spelled out in these discrete symbols without any natural continuity between them. And for that reason, we just go and work them one at a time, one after another. And it comes back to the fact that the, the power of the digital system is also its Achilles heel. The fact that we quantize after every very simple 
uh, computation means that we lose that very important continuity, which is a representation of physics. It's the nature of the world out there. And we've lost it when we did our, our digital. Well, as I said, it wouldn't be at all embarrassing except there are systems which uh, handle this kind of problem and handle it very nicely. This is a, uh, an illustration out of uh, Ramon Quijal's original book on the histology of the nervous system. And it just shows a few of the typical kinds of, of nerve cells in the brain. Uh, this is a structure which solves the kind of problems that we have broken our pick on uh, down through the last 50 years without really having made a dent in it. Um, if you look at one of these uh, computing elements, uh, it's rather strikingly different from our standard digital computer. Uh, it's made out of, uh, of goo. Uh, <laughs> uh, and and uh, that's not uh, quite so striking, but what is striking is that it has of the order of 10,000 inputs instead of the 2.5 plus or minus one or two that our standard logic gates do. Um, and these, uh, this is the input stuff up here and the output comes out down below. And you'll notice that these little bumpies, uh, are called spines, that exist on the input side of the neuron, uh, those are where the inputs come in and the inputs are clustered sort of rather far from where the quantization gets done down here in the body of the cell. Uh, well, what happens here that does all this marvelous computation? Well, the, uh, the inputs come in as pulses. They're discrete in time and discrete in amplitude, but the time of arrival, the relative time of arrival among the nerve pulses coming in uh, is distributed. It's, it's a continuous variable, and that's where the information is encoded. Certain combinations of nerve pulses arrive up here in the distant parts of the neuron, and they propagate down through these uh, active processes. There's a distributed amplification that goes on there, which has to be done just right. Uh, if you turn up the gain a little too much, those little signals that are coming down grow up and become just another nerve pulse and they quantize too soon. If the gain isn't enough, the little signals are coming down and they get lost on the way. So the thing has to be tuned up just right. We still don't know how to do that with artificial circuits, but we're working on it and it looks like a doable thing. Uh, what happens in a structure like this, we think, and it isn't known with great certainty at this point, is that that act of keeping all the little signals that come in in various places at various times and propagate down with just the right velocity so when they come together at these junctions, they come together with some sort of nonlinear interaction. That is actually a structure that keeps alive an exponential number of possibilities all in the same structure at the same time. And that's exciting. That means this may, in fact, be a structure whose computational capability goes exponentially with its size. Yeah, this may, in fact, be the structure that does it, which is why I've spent the last 15 years of my life trying to understand these things and trying to build little models of things that do something like that, because, after all, uh, electronics, the physics of electronics and the physics of the nervous system uh, even though it's goo, uh, it's electrical goo after all, and uh, has electrical signals in it, and we can make electrical signals too uh, in silicon, and uh, it has all the same continuity properties and gain possibilities that exist in the, the nervous tissue. And uh, we've managed to build some things. Uh, Gordon mentioned that it would be nice to have an existence proof that you could do something that was even remotely related to the thing you set out to do. Well, we've done some things that are remotely related to what we set out to do. Uh, it turned out to be much harder than we thought uh, to do anything that even remotely looks like uh, the nervous system. We've built some retinas. We've built some things that look for motion and stereo and that sort of thing. 
Uh, we've built some cochleas and uh, some things that might be really good cochlear implants. Uh, we've built some systems that allow the whole thing to learn as it goes along. And uh, I mentioned that the thing had to tune itself up or otherwise it was going to either go wildly unstable and you have massive epilepsy and that's not good. Uh, or it, the signals all die out and you become uh, why. Right? So um, then um, that wouldn't be good either. And um, one can now do learning that's distributed throughout the system and works in continuous time and that's all very nice. And one can imagine a system that is one level of a nervous system. It might look something like this, conceptually. It has an input. That input comes in in real time. And you have some kind of model, that is some kind of network of these artificial neurons and the job of the network of artificial neurons is to predict what the input's going to do next. There's some obvious evolutionary advantages in being able to predict what happens next, not just for companies, but for individuals as well. Um, then the output comes out here and goes up, and by that time, the, the thing that actually happened rolls around, and you can look at both of them and say, did I make the right Comparison: Did I make the right prediction? Just like uh, Gordon just did, except you're doing this on a millisecond by millisecond basis. If you've made the wrong prediction, you do two things. You correct the model a little bit, and you send the output out to the next level of the nervous system. It's well known that the way the nervous system works, it only brings things to your attention that are interesting and aren't just routine stuff. So. The nervous system's interested in things it's not predicting rather than in the things that are all old hat. It's a little like attendees at conferences that way. You know. mm -hmm. um, I think when one has this kind of system, we don't have this yet, but we're close. Uh, close means probably another 10 years. Uh, we'll be able to build systems that sit and look at the world in real time and extract from it what the interesting information is and filter that through several levels of that until the stuff that comes to the attention up at the top is the interesting stuff. Interesting in the same sense uh, that you and I mean interesting when we, we see things. So that's one, one possibility for a computing paradigm that's very, very different than anything we know today. Uh, and has the possibility of directly addressing some of these hard problems that we really haven't touched. The other possibility is to use a quantum system, and there's a lot of noise about this today. Uh, in fact, in your very own hometown, uh, there's been a lot of noise generated. And um, so I, sh I should say just a few, a few words about this. The title says quantum computation. What does it mean? Well, what it means is uh, you take some quantum system where the phase of the wave function of the electrons is preserved. Uh, you can do this with a, a bunch of atoms, or you can do it in a superconductor, or you can do it in, in a lot of different ways. And no one, by the way, has a way that really works in any real computational sense yet. But one could imagine that that could come along if we got the ideas right. And um, you encode the information uh, in the wave function of the electrons. Now, if you do that for one electron, it's not very interesting. It just kind of goes around and does the same thing. But if you encode it in the wave function for many electrons, the, each electron can be described, the wave function for it can be described in some kind of space. And the, the coupled wave function of many electrons is in a space which is the Cartesian product of the spaces for the original ones. So you enormously enlarge the space within which this collective system is evolving. Well, that sounds like an exponential to me. So that's interesting. Then you watch this time evolution. Of course, you have to be careful with quantum systems, because if you watch them too much, they get nervous and do something stupid. But, um, but if you're careful about all that, uh, you can, in principle, 
you can get computations done that are of this exponential character. And the most famous one, uh, we heard a little about encryption last night. Um, the most famous one that has been uh, done to date is to show that the factoring of large numbers upon which many of the public key encryption systems rest is actually a very easy problem if you do it with a system like this. And it can be done in a very short time, even for very long numbers, in principle. No one has built a quantum system which actually does this now, and there are lots of problems in doing that. But I sort of think, along with Gordon, if you can see a principle that's based in physical reality, at some point, we're going to find a way to embody that in a physical reality, and that will be really, really exciting. Uh, meanwhile, what's happened is it's given the computer science theorist a whole new model of computation to play with, and they're having a blast. I mean, they're doing great stuff with that. It's giving us, as scientists, it's giving us a much better sort of hands-on working level quantum mechanics rather than this sort of pie in the sky, oh my god, what if I measured it sort of thing that, that uh, hangs out. And, and uh, there are problems, as I mentioned, and there, there are problems that have to be worked. We don't see anything that is in principle a complete showstopper, but uh, the wave functions of electrons tend to get coupled to other stuff in the universe, and when they do that, they tend to lose their coupling with the ones you want, and instead couple with somebody that you don't want. And, uh, I guess if you're working in companies, you've probably seen the human equivalent of this going on. And uh, so you can lose uh, the information that way. And uh, that's right now people's biggest uh, concern about quantum computation. So in summary, I would say that uh, digital systems, they look like the whole world to us today. I look at them as a start on a, a range of computing paradigms uh, that will be with us uh, 50 years from now. Uh, 50 years from now, I suspect that we won't be using computer and digital computer as the only words that describe computation, that we'll have other kinds of things that we recognize as computation, like the things that are done in the nervous system the things that are done in quantum systems, we'll recognize those as doing interesting forms of information processing. Uh, that communication on the network won't be the only thing that's interesting. We'll actually uh, be doing more interesting problems uh, with the real world, with real time, with real perception, with real understanding of the world around us. We'll have many more ways to get inputs from the natural world into our cyberspace and that that's all going to be a very, very exciting 50 years. The preceding was excerpted from the ACM 97 conference presentations. ACM is the first and the world's largest professional society in computing. For additional speaker presentations, more information about ACM 97, or how to become a member of ACM, please contact the ACM 97 website or contact ACM at this address.